ISHR, we are here with your next video lecture on unemployment, or should we say low unemployment. Uh, this is available for, for anybody who wants to learn about IB, uh, higher level, standard level, economics, uh, and, and the unit on unemployment. So let's go ahead and look at the learning goals. This is a condensed form of all the IB standards. Um, everything in here, though, you'll find in the IB curriculum. So one, we're going to define unemployment. We're going to define something called the labor force. Um, these are key concepts for understanding unemployment. You also need to know how to calculate, higher level especially, how to calculate the level of unemployment. And we'll talk about that and how uh, sometimes there are little tricks um, and when you're calculating it. Next, examine why unemployment is difficult to calculate. There are some problems in calculating it, and you need to know those problems. We're going to talk about a variety of reasons why it's difficult, or maybe even the statistic is misleading. Finally, there are four types of unemployment. Ivy wants you to know these four types, and there are a couple of diagrams uh, that are associated with some of these types of unemployment, so you need to draw those diagrams when we come to them. All right, let's get right into it. You know, when you think of unemployment, what do you think of? Well, somebody that doesn't have a job, right? Like this guy right over here. Well, it's a little bit more than that. Because, again, governments compile data and statistics to measure the economic health of a country. And they have basically certain, um, you know, certain sort of parameters uh, for, you know, or methods which they can measure unemployment based on uh, the statistics available. So the government, most governments define, and IB defines uh, unemployment as when working age, so between 16 and 64, when working age people are actively searching for a job and are not employed. Um, so this is important because one, you know, obviously a government, when they're trying to, you know, look at their, you know, who's unemployed and who's, who's you know, wants a job and doesn't have one, um, they're not going to count really, really young people. You know, many governments have laws against child labor, um, and they're not going to count the elderly that are retired um, as part of their, you know, to, to factor that into the statistic. Another thing, too, is that the government um, only looks at the people that are unemployed. Um, they only identify them as such is it, when they are actively searching. So, uh, this is really, really important because there are people in the economy that are not actively searching for a job. They're not contained within that statistic. So, for example, if, if somebody is independently wealthy and they're 25 years old, they're not unemployed. They're, you know, they just, they don't have a job. They don't want one. Um, or somebody that elects to be a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad. Um, that's a job in itself, but the government, for statistical purposes, would not regard that person as unemployed. It's only when they start looking for a job that they're unemployed. Um, so that's the definition and just a few little, little bits to add on there. One other note, too, like how the government sort of calculates uh, unemployment is they use this sort of this little formula. Number of unemployed divided by the labor force times 100. And the labor force is basically the sum of all employed and unemployed, so people that don't have a job but want one, uh, between 16 and 64. So basically, uh, the labor force is, um, you know, it's the, what the government would regard as their working age population that are either working or want to work. And this is important for the statistic because um, you know they're they're going to they're going to be um, the government when they're calculating unemployment. How they usually do that is they'll look at all of the people that file income tax returns, and they'll say, okay, we've got all these millions of people that are paying taxes from their work, uh, getting the, from their income, and so um, we're going to calculate them as part of the labor force. Then they'll look at the people that go to the what's called the Department of Labor or the Arbeitsamt and that asked the government for what's called Arbeitslosigkeitsgeld, or unemployment insurance. When those people go and ask for money from the government, they're saying, I had a job, I lost it, and I need money to survive. So when those, those, the government processes these applications for extra money, and so they look at those as the number of unemployed people. So 
how the government sort of comes up with their statistic is they look at how many people ask for unemployment insurance or you know, certain uh, benefits from the government based on not having a job versus everybody that's paying income taxes from having a job. And so that's how we're kind of coming up with that statistic of unemployment. Now, it's important to remember that not everybody's included in the stats. So if, if somebody is, like we said earlier, if you're independently wealthy, if you're a stay-at-home mom or dad, you're not unemployed. You've got to be actively searching and not have a job. Um, and so just remember that. One other note, too, just that commonly trips up students, candidates in the uh, Paper 3 exam is uh, when you're calculating this, it's not the number un of unemployed divided by the population. It's the labor force. And there was an exam two years ago that tricked a whole bunch of students because it put the population uh, as one of the stats in there, and it was to purposefully mislead students. So, um, and that was what a lot of kids messed up on on their IB exam. So just kind of remember, it's the labor force. Okay, let's move on. Why is unemployment difficult to measure? Why is it misleading? Why is it sometimes inaccurate? Well, you know, maybe um, you probably have a hint from what we just talked about um, a moment ago with the, you know, having to be actively searching, but um, we'll kind of, and we'll develop that in just a moment. So one main reason why it's difficult to measure is hidden unemployment. Uh, this is basically phenomena or activity that obscure the statistic of unemployment. Uh, unemployment that exists, but it's hidden from the statistic. And we'll talk about the different ways that it's hidden. One way that it's hidden is something called underemployment. This is a term, I would write this term down. Basically, it's either if you are overqualified for your per present job. So if you're an engineer, but you're working as a janitor, um, you would be overqualified. Um, or if you're a doctor working as a nurse, you would be overqualified. Um, so that would be underemployed. Also, if you are a part-time employee, but you really want to work full-time, you're also technically underemployed. So that would sort of make unemployment, the statistic, a little misleading. Next, in some places, you know, unemployment is pretty, pretty high. Spain, for example, is still between 19 to 20 percent uh, the uh, level of unemployment. And that's here in 2017 that's still that high. So one in five people doesn't have a job. It's, it's pretty bad still. Um, during the height of the recession, it was at 25% or I think even maybe up around 27. Um, so during prolonged periods of time, uh, if, you, if people are just continually looking for work and they can't find a job, they will give up. And so remember that we define unemployment as people that don't have a job, that are working age, but actively searching. And so because people give up, um, this sort of makes the statistics a little bit misleading. I mean, if, for example, if you went to Spain, you could probably meet people there now that maybe they don't have a job, but if you walked up to them and they, you could ask them, are you looking for a job? And they might say, well, no, I'm not. And then you'd say, well, would you like one? And they might say, well, yes, definitely. I'll take one if you got one for me. Um, but you know, that those people are not counted in the statistic because they've given up, thus giving us a false sort of reading on unemployment in general. So a better uh, statistic, which we'll talk about in a minute, is called the LFPR, or the Labor Force Participation Rate. And we'll talk about that in a moment. All right. Sometimes uh, a lot of countries, this happens in both developed and developing economies, we have what's called informal or underground labor. And it's usually not recorded because these are jobs that people do um, and, you know, there's no tax involved. There's the government's not looking at these people as employed. So whether you are babysitting for your neighbors or maybe you're, you know, there are people that work as like cleaning ladies or cleaning men, um, there, are, there are a whole bunch of jobs that are just sort of not recorded by the government. And that would also make unemployment a little misleading because people would have jobs, but the government wouldn't know about it. Um, all right, next, labor force participation rate. We spoke about this a moment ago, but I want to add a little depth to it. Um, IB doesn't technically say you have to know this, but if you want to, like, really show your economics chops on the exams, it might help a little bit. 
um, especially in the sort of analysis section of your essays. Uh, basically, what labor force participation rate, it's looking at the total percentage of the, or the total working age population as a percentage um, of the, the uh, I'm sorry, I got myself tongue-tied. It's basically looking at the total percentage of the labor force, or the total, the labor force is a percentage of the working age population. That's worded wrong. It should say the labor force is a percentage of the working age population. So the formula is labor force divided by working age population times 100. And then, you know, by using this statistic, um, you can basically, you know, determine what percentage of the the people between you know 16 and 64 are either had either have a job or want one as a percentage of the whole, and so this might be a better indicator of the health of the labor market um, or the health of the of the factor of production labor within an economy because it shows you which amount of people in that working age range are actually working. Um, might also give you an indication of how much informal or underground labor exists in your country. And in some, some countries, that's a, there's a lot of underground labor. Um, so that also, why, that's another reason why unemployment could be very misleading if you've got everybody that's working informally or under the table. Um, you might think unemployment's higher or lower than it actually might be. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about the types of unemployment. There are four types that IB wants you to know. The first two, there are no diagrams. They're pretty simple. Um, let's get right into them. One's called frictional, and that's just when you are between jobs. And people could be between jobs for a whole bunch of reasons. You could decide to quit. You could get fired by your boss, or you could get laid off. Um, the difference is, uh, fired is you did a bad job. Your boss says you're you're fired. I don't want you here anymore. Laid off is a little different. That's when your boss says hey, I really hate to do this, but the economy's not very good or business isn't very good. We're going to have to let you go. Um, also, students entering the labor force for the first time are frictionally unemployed. So just when, when you're between jobs, um, it's probably the most common type of unemployment is frictional and probably one of the, the largest chunks of unemployment that you'll find in most economies. Next, seasonal. Basically, when there, it's defined as uh, when there's basically uh, demand for labor in certain industries that changes on a seasonal basis. Write down these two definitions, please. Um, they're pretty simple, uh, but just write them down. So as you probably can imagine, seasonal unemployment, you could probably come up with a whole bunch of examples for that as well, whether that's ski instructor or maybe um, someone who works at, in Germany. We have this very popular time in the summer where people love this asparagus spagel and you have a lot of people probably work in spagel in you know certain months of the year uh, because seasonally it's it only grows in you know late spring or something like that Germans go nuts for it I do too it's pretty tasty anyway there's two other types let's get into those two something called structural unemployment basically it's kind of a longer definition I apologize for this but this is my own definition and I want to um, you know, just feel that it's the most complete one that I could come up with. It's basically, it occurs for a couple of different regions. And so, you know, one of them obviously is a mismatch of labor and skills available. Um, so, you know, for example, employers are looking for technicians in certain types of fields, and maybe those types of technicians don't exist in the economy. Um, so that there's a mismatch of skills available and the type of skills that is desired by workers. Um, structural unemployment also occurs due to changes in technology. So when, for example, somebody gets replaced by capital or a robot at a factory, they would be structurally unemployed because, um, you know, they, they've been, you know, there's been a change in the structure of the, uh, how things are produced. Um, but so changes in technology, um, and so a diagram that can be shown to represent that um, is over there on the right. And we see a market for manufacturing jobs, we see the price of labor and quantity of workers, and you see a drop in the demand for labor um, from D to D1. And so when, when you see these two points here, the quantity of worker, the equilibrium quantity of workers has dropped from here to here. So if, for example, um, you know, 
this and this can happen for a few different reasons, but um, if, for example, firms are replacing workers with capital or with you know robots, um, maybe the demand for labor drops. In certain countries like the United States or Britain, labor is very expensive, and so um, when those firms relocate to another country, um, you know, for example, um, it says right here in the last example, a fundamental. Uh, the, a change in the fundamental structure of the economy. So in the United States and Britain, we're moving largely from a manufacturing to a service-based economy. So we've got a structural change in unemployment. So um, we've got a drop in demand for sort of manufacturing jobs for, you know, because those jobs are being replaced with technology, but also because those jobs are, um, you know, being relocated because of the high labor costs. So both examples of structural unemployment. Now, there's one more type of structural that we have to talk about, and that has to do with labor market rigidities. In both the United States and Britain and Germany and lots of other countries, there's what's known as labor market rigidity. So let's kind of unpack that concept. So if something is rigid, it doesn't flex. It's sort of um, unmoving. And so in certain markets, uh, there's a lot of regulations. Uh, in, in Europe and in Britain and America and, and all these places, and that can lead to structural unemployment as well. Um, IB has never asked this on an exam before, so you know I wouldn't be surprised here in 2017 if this popped up because they love to ask things that they never asked before. So one example of a labor market rigidity is a collective bargaining rights of unions. Unions represent employers, or not employers, employees, and they bargain with employers for benefits for their workers. Um, when those unions have more rights, uh, like in France or in Germany, they demand more benefits, higher pay, more vacation um, for their workers. And if the governments give a lot of rights to unions, that's going to cause the supply of whatever good or service we're talking about to move to the left because it's an increased cost of production. So when production costs go up, um, sometimes that also results in some people being unemployed um, because you know they the you know, the firm cannot afford to employ as many workers with higher production costs. Next, minimum wage legislation. When that's again another when the government steps in and says we're going to have a higher minimum wage, uh, that's an increase in production costs. Supply shifts to the left. So one way to represent minimum wage, um, its impact on the price of a good or service, you would shift supply to the left. Uh, and there's something in America called the OSHA, which is the Occupational um, Occupational Health and Human Services or Occupational I'm, I'm messing up the acronym, but basically what OSHA does is they have all these employee protection laws. Um, they uh, basically would say to, for example, factory workers, you have to buy all these safe, all this safety equipment, and you have to make sure that your chairs are of a certain standard, and you have to make sure that you have a wheelchair ramp, and you have to make sure that you have a fire escape, and and all these different things for your employees. They come in and they tell businesses. This is how you have to run your business. You have to pay for all these things so you have a safe, good, healthy work environment. And again, when you force companies to buy all this extra equipment, guess what? Production costs go up, supply to the left, and it could lead to structural unemployment. Finally, one other thing that I think is kind of interesting, and this is also in your IB, uh, IB syllabus and, and some of your IB textbooks, um, unemployment legislation. Martin Schulz, one of the guys here in Germany that is trying to become the new chancellor, wants to have a new law that makes companies pay more money for unemployment insurance, and they, he, they wants them to pay for more retraining as well. Um, and so it's an additional burden upon companies. I think he also wants to extend the time that uh, people can be unemployed um, all of this would mean more money from firms to support unemployment programs. So ultimately what this does is it acts as an increased cost on firms 
and uh, shift supply to the left. So all of these examples that I've just gone over are examples of labor market rigidities. And uh, they are one sort of form of structural unemployment. Uh, just don't want you to uh, miss out on that. Okay, finally, the last type of unemployment. It's called cyclical unemployment. And it is basically, also, it's also known as demand deficient. But if we have a recession, so it's, it's the, the, the definition is unemployment caused by a decrease in AD or a downturn in the business cycle or a recession. So define it any way of, with those three uh, would be acceptable. Uh, if we have a drop from AD2 to AD1, so we have lower real GDP, or real, yeah, GDP um, basically the demand for labor is also going to drop because as consumers have a lower demand for goods and services, uh, employers have a lower demand for labor. And so um, when this happens, you know, you have to remember that LRAS is the full employment of the factors of production. And so we are no longer at full employment right here. And so basically we've got a drop in AD and, you know, we've got unemployment in the economy. Obviously with a recession there's probably unemployment. So if you have to ever make a diagram for cyclical unemployment, just make the AD diagram to, and have it drop to the left and explain that if there's a drop in the demand for all goods and services, there's a drop in the demand for labor. And that's what happened in 2008, 2009. We had a big recession in Germany and the United States, all over in Japan, lots of places there was a huge recession and a lot of people got laid off from their jobs as a result. Now one other note, and I just want to include this real quick because I think it's kind of interesting. IB, for the last syllabus, used to tell students they needed to know what classic unemployment was or wage-based. And they used to say that uh, if you, you know, put a what's called a minimum wage or a price floor on wages, then uh, that sort of causes disequilibrium. And you guys probably remember from microeconomics, a price floor, right? If this was the equilibrium wage, and this was the demand for labor, and this was the supply for labor, if we had a minimum wage, right, the, a price floor, we would go from W1 to W2. Well, what would that do if we, you know, forced wages upwards? Well, um, basically the supply of labor the quantity supplied would be greater than the quantity demanded. If we have greater quantity supplied than quantity demanded, we call that a surplus. So we would have surplus labor. And some economists used to say, you know, don't raise minimum wage because number one, you know, you're going to be rewarding a bunch of unskilled workers higher wages. And number two, you're going to create a whole bunch of unemployment because people will get laid off and you know that won't that won't be very good for the economy we'll have higher unemployment so don't use minimum wage but ib has since excluded classic unemployment and i think the reason why they've done that is because and and just economists in general probably you know all are starting to acknowledge that minimum wage does not necessarily need lead to a net increase in unemployment in Germany, we instituted a minimum wage last year, or 2015, I think. And unemployment is pretty much the same. It has not really changed. I mean, there's been a, in a few small industries, like taxis. Uh, the taxi industry here in Hanover has been Im impacted, but that's kind of complicated, and it's, uh, it's for a variety of reasons. But just note this, is that minimum wage won't necessarily cause an increase in unemployment. It might cause prices to go up, um, but doesn't necessarily have to lead to unemployment, and it's no longer in the IB syllabus anyway. So the last thing we need to know, last point before we stop, is the natural rate of unemployment. And um, you, you have to know that in any economy, we're never going to completely get rid of all the unemployment. There's always going to be some. We're always going to have some frictional unemployment. There are always going to be people that quit their jobs. We're always going to have some seasonal unemployment, people that, you know, lost their jobs due to seasonal changes in the demand for labor. And finally, structural unemployment. There's always going to be changes in the structure of the economy. So when you look at all these things, you know that there's always going to be some unemployment. Um, now, the definition is written there for you uh, on the left. And it's a combination of frictional, structural, and seasonal um, that persist even in an expanding economy. Um, so just note that what the natural rate of unemployment is, it's the, those three things combined 
and that we're never going to get unemployment to zero. It's never going to be that low. But uh, what most economists and most central banks and people that collect ec economic data would tell you is that a unemployment rate of 5% or less is considered pretty healthy. So if you're lower than 5, you're in pretty good shape. Um, so, all right, now we're kind of done. Let's have a quick quiz. Uh, I want you to quiz yourself on what we've gone over. Uh, define the term unemployment. What's the formula? What were the four types? Could you define those four types? And what was that natural rate that we just talked about? What was, what was, that, what was that about? So quiz yourself, and let's see how you do. And um, we'll, we'll see you guys in class on Monday. All right, have a great day. Econ teacher out.